I would like to invite you into taking a quick break in this day on earth and to project yourself in the following experience. Imagine that you are outside. You can feel a gentle breeze on your face. The sun is setting and the stars are appearing. And you may notice a white star, Sirius, a red star, and Antares, a star that fits into a pattern like Zubanel Zanubi, or a tiny little star you'd never seen before, like Gina. And hearing these names, very soon you'd realize that the modern mapping of the sky was created out of a mosaic of languages retracing its history, from Sirius in Latin in the Renaissance to Zubanel Zanubi by the Arabs in the Middle Ages, back to the antiquity and the ancient Greeks with Antares, through to the ancient Egyptians who gave us our symbol for a star with five branches, all the way back to the ancient Babylonian people and the first star catalogs 3,000 years ago. The fourth star name, Ginan, is both more recent and more ancient. When astronomers have got too much time in their hands, they gather together and they start renaming the stars. It keeps them busy. But naming the stars is actually an incredible privilege. And recently, the fifth star in the Southern Cross was renamed from Epsilon Crucis to Ginan, the Goana, or Big Lizard, a totem animal for the Waterman people in Australia's Northern Territory, connected to a star story. And in their homage, that star was named after that ancestor and is now used by astronomers all around the world. We have such knowledge thanks to collaborations between indigenous people and astronomers, a relatively new science known as cultural astronomy that aims, that aims at understanding how different cultures and civilizations relate to the sky, scientifically and otherwise. In Australia, this collaboration started with a love story. William Dawes was an astronomer who embarked on the first fleet and was the first astronomer of Port Jackson, the colony that were to become Sydney. He was very curious and open about Aboriginal culture, and his little shack was said to be a peaceful place where Europeans and Aboriginal people alike would come for good conversations and friendships. Eventually, those befriended an Aboriginal woman called Patagorang, from whom he learned the local language and recorded it in his diaries. Some entries in the diaries include, can you blow out the candle or warming hands by the fire, suggesting that they may have had more than a friendship relationship. In 1972, those diaries were found, and they are paradoxically used today, one of the rare sources used today as a source of language to rebuild Sydney's Aboriginal language. Similar respectful collaborations between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and astronomers have lived on and have helped rebuild, revive, and record the astronomy for the Yongu people, the Burong people, the Walkeri people, the Gamilaroi people, the Uralia people, the Palawa people, to name a few. And here, in Australia's Blue Mountains, I have the greatest pleasure to collaborate with local Darug custodians to help relearn Darug astronomy. We travel in country together, we analyze engravings and stone arrangements and their astronomical orientation. We can also wonder if those cultural sites would be placed on a song line, one of these traditional routes that traverse the country and that were worked for thousands of kilometers like the Seven Sisters song line, starting in Western Australia and reaching all the way up to here, the Three Sisters in Katoomba. We also look into the Darug language, stories, and traditional knowledge for references to astronomical phenomena so that Darug astronomy can be revived and live on for the future generations. And so once these various astronomies from various people have been revived, they can generously be shared with the public for example, things through an astronomical software known as Stellarium. From this repository of astronomical knowledge, astronomers are able 
to learn more about humanity as a whole by putting the pieces side by side. A colossal constellation is a strong man lying near the celestial equator. For the ancient Greeks, his name is Orion the Hunter, and he's most famous for the three stars aligned in his belt. In Australia, it is sometimes referred to as the shopping trolley or the source band. And the Orion story is pretty long, but it starts with Orion falling in love, but then scaring away seven beautiful women, represented by a star cluster nearby, seven bright stars in a nearby star cluster called the Pleiades. Another name for the cluster is the Seven Sisters, or the Young Women. But who named it that? The Maori people in New Zealand. The Kiowa people in the U.S. The Seri people in Mexico. The Tuareg people in the Sahara. The Chukchi people in Siberia. The Anangu people in Australia. And the ancient Greek people back in Europe and actually many other cultures. Yes, all these cultures that have little to do with one another actually have the same name for the same stars. Even better, some of these cultures share a similar story for the same stars where the stars that make up Orion are a strong masculine figure chasing or courting the seven sisters. How is this possible? How could these cultures that have very little to do with one another, share the same story for the same stars. For context, the story of your star sign is about 5,000 years old. It's pretty old, dating back to the ancient Sumerian people and the invention of writing. In 2018, a study came out that retraced the genealogy of the various Orion stories all around the world and trace its possible origin back to Eastern Africa more than 80,000 years ago. That is the time when Homo sapiens, our species of humans, left out of Africa on a big exodus to populate the world as we know it today, possibly making the Orion story one of our strongest and oldest human cultural connections. This happened at the time where the cognitive ability for storytelling and abstraction has just emerged. And where is that story found? It is found in the sky, that canvas that has been used by most cultures around the world to, start, to store scientific knowledge and cultural information. Even excluding Orion, there is a lot of overlap between how we map the sky culture to culture. As much as stargazing involves the physical act of looking up into the sky and possibly later on a few sessions with a chiropractor, it is first and foremost a cognitive experience. Cultural astronomers and cognitive scientists have worked together and discovered that around the world most cultures use the same stars to make up the same constellations or asterisms. This is because the process through which humans associate stars together are according to two perceptual principles, at least two perceptual principles named as gestalt. Humans associate stars together that are bright and they associate stars together that are clumped visually together in a group. And so the tail of the scorpion, the star sign, is the hook of Maui for the Polynesian people. Corvus the crow is Hasta, the hand of the creator god Brahma in Vedic astronomy. And Pegasus, the flying horse, is Moose, the Moose, for the Native American Ojibwe people. Humans are wired to have an intimate connection with the sky, a projection device that does not require pixelized screens, only imagination. When my fiance Caroline and I started running stargazing tours in the Blue Mountains, we thought that the reason why people would want to join was for astronomy education. But it turns out that there is so much more. It could be to be immersed in a starry sky, or to see the Milky Way, to take a break, to feel the cold of the night, or spiritual celebrations, like the end of the Ramadan with the setting of the first moon crescent. Or to see something rare, like a comet 
or an aurora, or simply to see the star signs. This is because how you see the sky is a reflection of your time. It's a reflection of your identity and of your relationship with the world. Back in the time of the ancient Greeks, people spent their entire lives with their gods and heroes living above their head, watching upon them. Imagine if we did that today and recreated, we recreated the constellations with our own heroes. You would not have the snake bearer here, Cassiopeia over there, and Hercules in the back. But this one here would be Spider-Man. Right here you'd have Princess Leia. And this one here looking a bit out of place could be Mr. Bean. These actually happened in the 18th century, when Western astronomers decided to populate the seventh sky as to now devoid of constellations with new ones. French astronomer Nicolas Louis de Lacaille placed scientific instruments of his time, such as the compass, the telescope, or the air pump, as new constellations. The Dutch Petrus Plantius projected exotic animals that were the most exciting curiosities to naturalists at the time. Suddenly, it is not the gods who are up in the sky watching upon us. It is us, humans, who are placing our own discoveries and accomplishments in the sky. The celebration of the human intellect has replaced the wrath and the care of the ancestors so venerated by the once humble little humans. Today, we have insidiously forgotten about the night sky. Apart from astronomers, access to the heavens is secondary. But the sky is at risk. We live in boxes where a ceiling is blocking the view to the sky. In big cities, light pollution from artificial lighting is such that some people who were born there have never seen the sky in their entire, never seen the stars in their entire lives. And light pollution is not only an Earth problem anymore, it is also a space problem. Currently, there are more than 8,000 satellites orbiting the Earth. You can see them right after sunset and before sunrise as the little white dot flying across the sky. The light from the sun is reflected on their solar panels and projected back onto Earth and then scattered into the Earth's atmosphere. Since the invention of satellites, the sky has become 10% brighter, and we cannot see the fainter stars we were able to see back then. In the next 10 years, there is another 60,000 satellites that is planned to be launched. That's 40,000 for Elon and 20,000 for Jeff. Combining ground and space light pollution, the sky is brightening at an alarming rate of 10% every year. But does that matter to everyday humans? The experience of looking into the night sky is not granted. During the COVID crisis, when people had to stay home and needed space more than ever, I broke a telescope and I could not buy a new one. It was a global shortage due to high demand. People needed to look up. So yes, it does matter to everyday humans. I don't know about you, but I want my children to be able to see Orion's belt and the Milky Way and the tiny little starry fuzzy clusters that we can see with the naked eye. Preserving a night sky would only require to change the way we light up our streets and I also have good hope that space law, which, believe it or not, is a growing field, will help us safe keep our night sky from space light pollution. For millennia, humans all around the world have been connecting to the sky with reverence, with dread, with mystery, with fascination, with awe. The sky is a never ending source ask crucial scientific questions, such as, where did life come from, and is there anybody else out there? It is a representation system, a celestial mirror to our identity. We have been looking up into the sky 
to be guided into making meaning of our human experience. We placed our stories in the sky, and with that we placed our hopes, our doubts, our values, our wounds, our greatest inspirations to live. In many indigenous cultures around the world, there is a common wisdom that invites us for a harmonious life to care for three things. And those three things are to care for oneself, to care for our fellow human beings, and to care for the earth. And now it turns out, if we want to remind ourselves of our humanity, we must also care for the sky. Thank you.